Hello and welcome to this month's AFOX in Saka. Our two guests today will speak on restitution of African artifacts and on epilepsy in Africa. Now, the current wave of international pressure to return looted African artifacts has captured quite a bit of attention, particularly with regards to the Benin bronzes. The first talk reflects on a campaign that dates back to the colonial period that was arguing for the restitution of Nigerian artwork and how that might relate to, current, to the current wave. Our second talk is based on epilepsy research in Zimbabwe. It will try to disentangle why this condition identified thousands of years ago remains so hidden and stigmatizing. And I actually wonder whether there are any parallels with understandings of an engagement with mental health in some contexts. Now about the speakers, Dr. Terry Ochiaga and Professor Arjen Sen. Terry is a lecturer in world literatures in English at Royal Holloway University of London. Her research is on the history of British colonial education in Nigeria and its literary representations. It sheds light on the complexities of identities that are formed to facilitate navigation of different cultural spaces. She has published a book, The Clean Up Lagos Campaign by Duckworth, which highlights the political use of deviants. Terry will tell us more about this campaign in her talk. Arjen is Associate Professor of Clinical Neurosciences here in Oxford and head of the Oxford Epilepsy Research Group. He's also a consultant neurologist at the John Radcliffe Hospital. His focus is on developing treatments that may ameliorate both seizures and the comorbidities that commonly associate with epilepsy. Now, as is usual practice, the speakers will each give a 15 minute talk in succession. The Q&A will be after both talks. So please do remember to post your questions in the chat box. And uh, you may also use uh, Slido where you can post your questions anonymously. And the code is 634134, which is also available on the chat. Now, first up is Terry and her talk is titled Nigeria Magazine, a colonial precursor for the Legacy Restoration Trust. Terry, over to you. Good evening, everyone. As everyone here must have heard by now, a week ago on 29 April 2021, the German government announced that a substantial number of Benin bronzes looted amidst extreme violence from the Kingdom of Benin in present day Nigeria by British colonial forces in 1897 are scheduled for return in 2022. This decision follows on the heels of recent agreements between Western institutions and private individuals and the Legacy Restoration Trust, a Nigerian organization tasked with the restitution and preservation of Nigeria's artistic treasures in the country and in the country. Return movements for Nigerian cultural restitution um, are not as new as recent paradigm shifting um, accomplishments might suggest and their precedence as far back as the 1930s. It is with one such movement that I'm concerned today. Right, so our two protagonists are Edward Hallen Dogworth and Kenneth C. Murray. They met at um, the Eastern Nigerian Elite Colonial Government College um, uh, government College Umwahia, on which I wrote my first book in 1931. Murray was leading um, a specialist art um, education program at the school, which yielded um, such formidable artists, Ben and Wong. Um, and Duckworth was there on his first tour as inspector of education. They were in many ways like-minded individuals and became friends back then. In 1933, Duckworth became um, the founding editor of a magazine called The Nigerian Teacher. Its purpose was to serve as a form of exchange between African um, education officers and European education officers. Um, and uh, in 1935, Stanley Milburn, who was then superintendent of education in Nigeria, um, published uh, an article called, provocatively entitled, um, These Disgusting Images. And the piece exhorted Western readers to try not to judge African artists' motives by European standards, for it is better to recognize ignorance than condemn African artists as unskilled and worthless. 
Crucially, it urged for the creation of a museum in the country, because what is being talked about is not exactly the best of Nigerian art. The theme of Nigerian artistic excellence and the need for its preservation um, was a recurrent um, theme over the first, uh, the next two years, and it became pivotal when the Nigerian teacher was reborn as developmental and cultural magazine Nigeria in 1937. Duckworth was the magazine's editor, photographer, and main contributor in the magazine, apart from disseminating positive, if occasionally paternalistic images of the country, um, became a vehicle for his passions. And one such passion was Nigerian art. Duckworth was an engineer by training and had been recruited into Nigeria's colonial um, education system as, um, to establish science teaching in its government secondary schools. But his interactions with other education officers, particularly Moray um, and Milburn, had resulted in a very keen interest in African antiquities. He submerged himself in such terms as antique works of art from Benin collected by Lieutenant Pete Rivers and Leo Frebinus, The Voice of Africa, and began to contribute in passion if amateurish um, uh, articles to such outlets as the Daily Times. By September 1933, he was liaising with Milburn about the creation of an antiquarian section of the education department. When Duckworth announced the transformation of Nigerian teacher into Nigerian magazine, Nigeria magazine, which became effective in 1937, the publicity brochure stressed the imperative of the periodical to respect the past, record its history, treasures its signposts, and help to build museums in Nigeria. Duckworth expanded on this mission in the editorial of the magazine's first issue. From the inception of this new era, the discussion revolved around three different concerns. The first, Ife antiquities, contemporary looting practices of an ethnographic and commercial nature, the recuperation of these pieces, and the urgent need for museum facilities to preserve them. Two, Benin bronzes as quintessential emblems of cultural spoliation and the need to return them to Nigeria or keep them in British museums. And also the preservation of the minor antiquities left unprotected in Benin. And finally, the urgency of preserving recent archaeological discoveries, notably the stone figures of Essie. Um, most of the authors of these articles were European, but there were two notable African contributors. The first was Adesoji Adermi, who was the Oni of Ife, um, and Chief Jacob U. Agarupa, um, who published articles on the history of their respective towns and discussed the preservation of antiquities. The Oni, in particular, worked closely with Marion Duckworth and plans for a museum at Ife. The 1938 British Empire exhibition at Glasgow gave a great impetus to the movement. Duckworth was asked to curate a Nigerian section on arts and crafts, and Murray helped him to assemble the exhibits. At some point, one of the organizers um, thought that it would be a good idea to have um, and a sort of extended booklet on the section. And Duckworth decided that number 14 of Nigeria magazine um, was going to um, function as a sort of um, catalog for the exhibition. He wrote a three page editorial and Murray introduced and guest edited the issue. It did have a very small section on antiquities um, featuring Duckworth's article, recent archeological discoveries in the ancient city of Ife in which he denounced the inadequate provisions for the safekeeping of, bron of bronze heads and terracottas in the Onis Palace and another by Milburn on the stone figures of Essie. Despite the brevity of the section, it aroused the interest of a number of key individuals in England. At the conclusion of the exhibition, Sir William Rosenstein, art advisor to the Secretary of State for the Colonies, invited Duckworth to discuss Ife heads. He embraced the idea of the museum scheme and published some of the Ife photographs in Burlington Magazine. Um, likewise, um, well, sorry, excuse me, accompanying an article by H.M. Meyerowitz, who was head of the art department at Achimota College. Murray then contributed the comments on um, Ife and also um, the Essie um, stone um, sculptures and um, in the sphere. But all that happened back in Nigeria for a while was that, that the um, assistant of the architects of the public works department was, and I quote, to call in some time at IFE and see if anything could be done about a building. The fact that government had disregarded the commercial opportunities generated by Nigerian arts and crafts in the exhibition and also um, the cavalier attitude to antiquities exasperated Duckworth, who began to express his dissonance with government in the magazine while mobilizing his networks in high colonial circles in the metropole. 
Back in Nigeria, Duckworth worked steadily to curb the constant removal of antiquities by Western travelers, conveying information to government on suspicious activities in and around key sites. A particular case of exfoliation um, that occurred around this time became crucial in the success of Duckworth's Duckworth and Mario schemes. Robert Tinier has described this incident in great and entertaining detail in a journal article published in Africa, Journal of the International African Institute, but the gist is as follows. So William Earl Bascom, an anthropologist on Yoruba society and culture, who was then based at Northwestern University, Illinois, was in Nigeria conducting research, and he got to purchase two bronze heads that had been found um, during construction work in a compound about 100 yards away from the palace of the Oni of Ife. Um, he surreptitiously took them out of the country to his home institution and published a much acclaimed article on the heads in the Illustrated London News on 8 April 1939. Um, the, the, the article was entitled um, An African Donatello. Duckworth and Moray immediately contested Bascom's appropriation of the heads and demanded their return to Nigeria. The insistent lobbying led to the hurried creation of an antiquities bill prohibiting the export of Nigerian antiquities except with written permission, and also the Ife native administration tightened bylaws regarding the disposal of antiquities. Still, Bascom held fast to the heads. He insisted that he hadn't, um, that, that no law um, prohibited his taking them away. And um, he said he would only return them if um, Britain returned the antiquities um, that it held in its museums. A protracted war of letters ensued involving Bascom, Douglas, Murray, the State Department, the Union of Ife, and the colonial government of Nigeria. Um, parallel to the realms of correspondence, Duckworth intensified their calls for the return of heads in Nigeria magazine in 1946, 48, and 51. Bascom eventually relented, forced by his inability to conduct research in Nigeria. But he did so demanding signed and dated retractions from Duckworth and Mori, acknowledging his integrity and exonerating him of guilt. Nigeria magazine published a groveling article that reflected his supposed magnanimity. And those images that you've just seen come from that article. You see um, the inscription where um, he's just basically um, giving these um, bronzes, not giving them back, but rather donating them to Nigeria. But let's leave Bascom behind and concentrate on the overall coverage of antiquities in the magazine, as I mentioned earlier. The conversation revolved around Ife bronzes. Duckworth underscored that the antiquities were carried off um, Nigeria by foreigners, Americans, Germans, and a Czechoslovakian, and were mostly taken to Germany and the United States, even if some of the items ended up in the British art market. And while it would be ideal to restore these objects to Nigeria, Duckworth posited that the British Museum um, would be a savior of sorts, a much more fitting location than the aforementioned countries. But the generosity of a subscriber to the National Art Collection Fund allowed for the purchase of one of the Ife heads. Duckworth enthused that it had found, I quote, a more appropriate home than others, since it has become a treasured exhibit in the British Museum in London. In another article, the magazine declared itself in favor of enriching the galleries and museums of Britain by the purchase of outstanding art treasures which come into the market from time to time. What Duckworth affirmed in the article Museums, an urgent need in Nigeria. West Africa may legitimately remind white people of their debt, the slave trade of commercial exploitation and of the seizure, um, or at least of, of the seizure, or at least purchase at absolutely low prices of its work of art that have enriched collections of Europe and America and have inspired modern movements in art. The acquisition of Benin bronzes was occasionally discussed in euphemistic terms that obscured extreme violence behind the acquisition. Sometimes the words looted, plundered, pillaged were used, but the history of the punitive expedition of 1897 was never expanded upon. Still, Duckworth um, ambivalently noted. After the punitive expedition to Benin in 1897, many of the captured bronzes were sold by the British government as scrap metal, and it was really owing to the initiative of Germans who secured a majority of the work for their own museums that Benin became famous. Later, another German brought to light the treasures of Ife and managed to carry off some of the best, which are now beautifully looked after 
in Frankfurt Museum. Many European museums have far more works than they can show or even adequately catalog, and they might possibly be willing um, to give some of their surplus uh, exchange duplicate specimens. Well, most of Duckworth's vitriol was directed at government um, and individuals doing the looting. Um, he, he did decry, well, he did, considered the uh, laissez-faire attitude of Nigerians to their own art and antiquities, momentarily for, forgetting the obstacles that even he, um, as a white colonial officer, had been unable to surmount. Possibly it is not right to be too critical, he said. If the treasures of the country are to be safeguarded, it may be better for them to be taken away and preserved in London, Berlin, or New York. It is deplorable to visit Benin City and the Adoekiti district or Iwo country, see them rotting away. Does no one in Nigeria care for beauty, for history, for culture? Right, he, um, and he also cast a blame in direction of the Benin peoples, exhorting the Benin native administration to establish a museum to preserve their heritage. In 1943, government created a Department of Antiquities named Maurice Surveyor and allotted 25,000 pounds to purchase of Nigerian antiquities abroad. The first Kaiser Square National Museum was submitted in 1948 and Dogworth and Maury also channeled their energies towards the creation of a special museum at Ife, which eventually materialized in 1954. In the immediate post-war years, some Benin ivories and bronzes that were completely or almost completely unrepresented in Nigeria had been recovered as were some fine bronze heads. In 1947, Nigeria held its first exhibition of antiquities attended by 43,000 visitors in just the space of two weeks. Exhibits were only about a quarter of what had already been collected for a Nigerian museum, chiefly articles obtained since 1946. Considering the times and circumstances, this could be classed as success. But as Duckworth moaned in an article entitled The Recovery of Benin Antiquities by 1949, only 50 Benin bronzes and ivories are in Nigeria, while there are between two and 3,000 in England and other countries. Duckworth retired in July 1953, and my story should end here. But on Saturday, 9 March 1957, three years after Duckworth's retirement from government service, one of the principal aims of Duckworth and Murray's um, movement materialized. The Museum of National Antiquities, Traditional Art and Ethnography opened at King's George Memorial Park on Econ Lagos. Under Murray's direction and curatorship, it boasted 6,000 pieces, very of which were displayed due to lack of space. These included a 2,000 year old terracotta head from Nark, uh, Benin Roses, and if a head, and several masks from Eastern Nigeria. While Murray had accomplished and was ultimately responsible for the actual establishment of the museum, the press gave Duckworth's efforts their due in the report um, of the opening. I quote, the idea was that of Mr. E.H. Duckworth, indefatigable champion of the need to preserve under ideal con con conditions all that is best of traditional and historic interest in Nigeria, hailed the daily service. A. Gimo Kwede, writing for the Daily Times, also affirmed that Duckworth jolted government into awareness of its responsibility in this direction. Apparently, the government took a lot of jolting. So let's have a look now at a sort of comparative view between what I'll call the movement and um, today's um, Legacy Restoration Trust. So the movement was um, uh, spearheaded by independent colonial officers. I put that between quotes because colonial officers are never, um, can, can kind of be independent and are never considered private individuals. Um, they always represent the interests of government. Legacy Restoration Trust is an independent, not-for-profit organization. Um, as we've seen, um, the movement began as a private initiative spearheaded by Murray and Duckworth, including other education officers, the Oni of Ife, at odds with government in its beginnings, it had a conflicted relationship during the war years, increased collaboration um, as a result of the Bascom debacle. And born out of the um, wild legacy restoration trusts, spun out of discussions um, among the Obao Benin, the Benin Dialogue Group, the Edo State Government, and Nigeria's National Commission for Museums and Monuments. Um, the movement um, was um, tasked with the recuperation of antiquities at home and abroad, with exceptions, um, and attracting funding and creation of museums, but there was no research component. Um, as opposed to um, uh, the Legacy Restoration Trust, which um, apart from recuperating antiquities abroad with no exceptions, support, um, also supports heritage and archeological projects, um, attracts funding, secures execution, um, capability for high value arts and cultural projects. Um, again, the movement had three flagship projects. So the Department of, of Antiquities, National Museum Lagos, National Museum at IFE, the flagship project, um, for the Legacy Restoration Trust is the Edo Museum of West African Art. 
Um, the museums that Duckworth and um, Murray envisaged were run by colonial European officers with Africans working in secondary capacities, while the Edo Museum of West African Art um, is posited to be a model museum, fostering a generation, a new generation of Africans who will be at the forefront of curating cultural artifacts. So to conclude, um, the Nigeria magazine movement um, lives on in the Legacy Restoration Trust. After all, Nigeria's National Commission for Museums and Monuments, um, one of its constituent entities is the natural heir of the Department of Antiquities created in 1943. Dr. Murray gently fought um, consistently for the preservation of antiquities in Nigerian museums and restored significant treasures to the country. But as we have seen, and to loosely adapt Chino Achebe's um, saying about elite colonial education in his essay, Dedication of a British Protected Child, a restoration movement that emerged within colonial ranks could never be a model of perfection. Dockwood and Maurice's plans for Nigerian National Museums were ambivalent and very much inflected by their locatedness, despite their eccentricity in the colonial sphere. They did not fulfill the imperative um, vision that Dan Hicks outlines in his masterful work, The British Museums, Spinning Bronzes, Colonial Violence, and Cultural Restitution, which he says is um, where he envisions the um, museum as a site of conscience, of traditional restorative justice, and of cultural memory. The museum, as a process as an end point. This is what the Edo Museum of West African Art is set to become and what it is hoped that ethnographic museums in the West are on their way to becoming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry, for that um, concise account of efforts that were taking place 70 years ago and also yeah, how they compare with um, today's conversation. Um, we shall move to the next talk, but please do post your questions for Terry in, in the chat box. Now, our second um, presentation is by Arjan, and it is titled Perspectives on Destigmatizing Epilepsy in Africa. Um, thanks very much, Watu. Um, hopefully, you can all see my screen there. Um, yeah, you can see your screen. Um, it's not in full view, so maybe you might want to put it in okay. the slide view mode. Is that okay now? Well, that is sharing your screens. It's not quite the one. Okay. It was bound to go wrong. So <laughs> That's all right. let me stop it and share it again. One sec. How's that? Um, so this is the presenter's view. It's not, okay. yeah, quite it. It's just, I'll just take presenter view off. That should be okay now. Yeah, I think let's carry on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, good Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for to um, and Afni for interest. Uh, inviting me to present here. Um, as you know, the INSARCA is designed to highlight very different areas of research in Africa. And this is certainly very different to Terry's thought-provoking talk that you've just heard about. Um, I'm a consultant neurologist in Oxford and also the um, uh, very lucky to have been an AFOX award um, awardee. So we received an AFOX grant some time ago, and I'll come back to why that's so important a bit later on. So we're going to be talking about epilepsy, and epilepsy is an enduring global health imperative. And it was suggested by the WHO in 2019 that it should be listed as a public health imperative. And we're going to explore why that is and some of the difficulties that still persist for people with epilepsy. Now, I hope you like this slide. I try to say this slide at every opportunity and hopefully you can see the cogs turning there. Um, and this is all of you. So the brain network is working correctly. Now, all of us on this call will have little individual nerve cells that are firing off incorrectly all the time. But what happens in epilepsy is that you get a network of nerve cells that fire incorrectly in one part of the brain. So the network starts to fire incorrectly, and that's what results in a seizure. 
Now, seizures are very common. 5% um, of us will have a seizure at some stage in our lifetime. And there are about 600,000 people in the United Kingdom uh, who have epilepsy. It accounts for 1% of the total burden of disease, affects all socioeconomic groups, but has a predilection for people in lower socioeconomic groups, affects all ages, and the highest incidences in older populations, and that applies across the world. So populations are aging faster in resource poor settings, about three times faster than in places like the United Kingdom. And so the prevalence of epilepsy is only going to increase. In, these are the key statistics to remember about epilepsy. So 50 million people have epilepsy worldwide, 85% of whom live in low to middle income countries. And it's a condition that associates with significant risk, risk of injury, risk of head injury, and occasionally see, um, seizures and epilepsy may associate with mortality. It also strongly associates with comorbidities of cognitive difficulties, and mood related problems such as depression, for example. And we may get a chance to talk about the intersection of epilepsy and mental health a bit later on. Regrettably, there's an 80 to 85% treatment, treatment gap in resource poor settings for epilepsy, despite epilepsy being a very treatable condition. So you said that it increases mortality. The standardized mortality ratio is two to three times that of the general population. Sudden ex unexpected death in epilepsy may account for up to 17% of all epilepsy related deaths, but it can be perceived very be a frightening and stigmatizing and limiting disease. And that's what we're really going to explore. But while we're exploring this, we need to remember that the majority of patients could be controlled with anti-seizure medications that probably cost less than one pound per month. Now, I mentioned before that epilepsy is an enduring global imperative. And why did I say that? Well, it's because epilepsy is a really ancient disease. We've all been confronting over the past 18 months the horror that is COVID, but epilepsy was written about in Babylonian texts and Hippocrates identified um, so long ago that actually this condition, which at that time was called the sacred disease, was actually no more sacred than any other disease. So it was not something divined by the gods, but it was a condition that had physical and mental afflictions as any other might. Despite that recognition, epilepsy has been stigmatized throughout time. There are multiple ancient beliefs or beliefs that are attributed to being ancient relating to possession, lunacy, retribution, um, or that epilepsy is actually contagious. And these are just some examples of that. So Julius Caesar, for example, had epilepsy. And at the time that Julius Caesar had epilepsy, what was considered to be the treatment for epilepsy was gladiator blood. So that's what you see on the right-hand side of your screen is a gladiator who's unfortunately been killed. And what would happen is people would stand with small clay pots just outside the walkway of the Colosseum. So as people were being dragged out of the Colosseum, they would try and collect the blood in those small pots, then rush home and then give it to their relative who might have seizures. And seizures tend to stop of their own volition. But if you happen to give the gladiator blood at the time that the seizure is stopping, you fuel a myth that actually it was the gladiator blood that helped stop the seizures. And so unfortunately, these things become embedded in society. This is a, a lithograph from about the 14th, 15th century. And you can see here a patient with epilepsy who rather being, than being taken to a physician is being taken to a priest to try and stop the seizures. But these ancient beliefs persist even now and they persist in all societies. So these are just some examples that are taken over the last 20 years. So as short ago as um, 2002, nearly 30% 30 30 of people in the Czech Republic thought that epilepsy was a form of insanity. In 2004, in the United Kingdom, more than 50% of people thought that uh, people with epilepsy should be treated differently. And it's worth noting that many laws relating to epilepsy were, were only repealed in the 1970s, even in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> 
In 2005, a study showed that parents had great objection to their children marrying people with epilepsy. And about 10 years ago, there was a study in Georgia which showed that about 14% of people wouldn't allow their children to play with someone with epilepsy. And the attitudes were worse in those with medical training. That wasn't necessary, necessarily doctors and nurses, but it could, for example, include um, secretaries or administrative workers who worked within the health service and had some contact with medical services. So what about in Africa? Well, about three years ago, there was a systematic study of the stigmatization of epilepsy in Africa, and it captured data from 23 studies. And I've just put on the map the number of studies from the relevant countries. Don't worry, we're not going to test geography, but you can, you can see where the relevant studies were from. Multiple different populations were looked at, including parents, but also spouses and the impact of epilepsy on marriage was evaluated, as was school children and doctors, teachers, lots of different things were done. And what they found was that stigmatization and misconceptions about epilepsy were widely prevalent. This is just an example, this is a table taken from the same paper, um, illustrating the kind of misconception categories that exist. So related to the cause and nature of epilepsy, whether epilepsy might be caused by witchcraft or relate to demonic possession, whether treatment should really be guided by traditional healers or that epilepsy, which I mentioned earlier in the talk, was actually a very treatable neurological condition, but a sense that epilepsy was not curable. Still that persistent sense that there is something related to religiosity and this is related to possession, divinity, something related to the gods is still very prevalent. And in terms of integration into the community, there was quite considerable objection to marrying people with epilepsy, some sense that people with epilepsy should only marry other people with epilepsy. And again, a, a risk that a thought that epilepsy may be contagious. There were some positive responses, but overall, when looking at epilepsy in relationships, the majority of responses were very negative. Looking at these, this um, systematic review, parents who were asked if they would allow their children to marry someone with epilepsy, 33% replied negatively in Cameroon, but in Ethiopia, 82.5% replied negatively, saying that they would not want their children to marry someone with epilepsy. Now, all of these studies were set up slightly differently. Uh, you can't really compare directly between the two countries, but you can say that broadly speaking, there is a, re a great reluctance for parents to allow their children to marry someone with epilepsy. And these misperceptions related to epilepsy tended to associate with rural, rural residents, male sex and lower educational attainment. And this background, sort of seeded the work that we began to look at. So we became very interested really in the impact of epilepsy upon marriage. And we, this came about actually in Oxford initially because we noticed that we had many older men with epilepsy, which often the seizures had happened from sleep and they really had not been too bothered by the seizures but their wives would say that now they could not sleep because they were up all night worrying that their husband might have a seizure. We then did a small study in Oxford to explore that and found that there were um, differences in how males and females spouses perceive the epilepsy. And we wanted to look at that in other locations. And so very luckily we were awarded an AFOX grant to take this work to Zimbabwe. And you can see in this picture, um, Professor Mahone in the front of the picture here, I'm somewhere in the background. And this is work that we did with the Epilepsy Support Foundation, just trying to find out what perceptions were related to epilepsy. We did different focus groups all over the country, starting in Harare and then moving to more rural settings. And we had a wide variety of people age, and, um, uh, attending different ages. Um, we had occasional children, parents attending and some faith healers. And we tried to capture perspectives related to marriage. 
And what we found is that it was difficult for husbands. You know, they felt that they became very socially limited. They couldn't do things that um, their counterparts would do. They couldn't, for example, go out and drink alcohol. But it was extremely difficult for wives who were often very shunned, for example, having to wash clothes in rivers downstream of the other villagers. And there's huge risk in that, because if, for example, you have a seizure downstream of everybody else, then you may fall into the water and be washed away. Whereas if you were upstream, you might, be, might get caught by others. But the reason for being downstream is a sense that even from the washing of clothes, that epilepsy was contagious and that somehow the epilepsy would be transmitted through the water and again result in other people having seizures. We realize from this that it's essential to have an ethnographic basis to our understanding of epilepsy. And this is the work that Sloan um, has been leading on in all of the projects that we're looking at in epilepsy currently. Traveling is amazing and it treats teaches you many things at lots and lots of different levels. And just like every country, Zimbabwe really taught me a lot. Um, and it's a place, and it's perhaps not really what you think. So there are definitely traditional healers. And often, um, maybe until the past 20 years, um, medicine, conventional medicine, has tried to shun traditional healers. But actually, traditional healers are very respected members of society and are often far more trusted than doctors. And so now we are much more looking to engage with traditional healers to try and destigmatize epilepsy. The other thing that I really remember from that first trip is that when we went to a supermarket, only we were using cash. Everyone else was using mobile technology to pay for things, uh, including mobile wallet, for example. And that led me to think that actually there is quite a lot of very good infrastructure relating to mobile technologies. And we need to look at how we can try and destigmatize epilepsy using social media and those platforms. Now, if we're meeting face to face, I often put up this slide and we go through and see how many people can identify the different um, icons that are illustrated from social media here. I won't do that today, but I updated this last night just to now reflect the number of active users for each of these platforms. And you can see, for example, that 2 billion people use WhatsApp regularly, a billion people use Instagram, less than 50 million use MySpace, which was the original social media, and about 2 billion people use YouTube. We did a previous study looking at how seizures were depicted on YouTube, and about only a third of the seizures that are reported to be seizures on YouTube are actually seizures or the type of seizure that they claim they are. But this is a very, very powerful medium, and we need to engage with these if we're going to really try and destigmatize epilepsy. By contrast, we all want to get our papers into nature, for example, but nature only touches about 0.5 million people per issue. So if you really want to make change, there's going to be, have to be engagement with social media. It's also true that stigma um, can pervade social media, and you will have all seen that, that has become very prevalent even during the COVID pandemic. So it is a tool that can be used wisely, or it can be used for ill, and how we try and mould our research to try and use it in the best possible way is going to be very important going forwards. Now, I said at the start, that I was lucky enough to be an AFOX grant awardee. And I thought I'd just show you how AFOX has changed my life. And I've said that before at presentations and it really has though. So we started with a 4,200 pound grant from AFOX. Um, we then went on to get a World Federation of Neurology grant, which is the current work that we're doing in Zimbabwe to look at destigmatization of epilepsy, but specifically questionnaire based approaches to married couples around the country to try and get gauge different perceptions of the illness. We were then lucky enough to then get a five million pound grant on the back of this work from the NIHR. We got a small grant to start work in Africa and then most recently got a 1.2 million pound grant to really see the same kind of work, not just in Africa, but now globally, including um, 
Indian and Brazilian partners and trying to develop epilepsy related technology, also looking at apps and really trying to consolidate social media presence is going to be very important in all of these grants. This has led to two major projects, the Epilepsy Pathway Innovation in Africa project called APINA, which is funded by the NIHR and the Oxford Martin School program on global epilepsy funded by the Martin School. And in the picture, you see myself with Gif Nguende, who has become a great friend over the years. At the time that picture was taken, Gift was the only full-time neurologist in Zimbabwe. And we've uh, done lots of things together. We now tend to see each other on Zoom and uh, or communicate via WhatsApp rather than in person, but hopefully that time will come. But from that meeting, this team grew. And so this is the APINA team, um, which as you can see involves a wide variety of different professionals, all now working to try and help people with um, epilepsy in Africa. And so as you can see, it really has changed my life. This is now what we do with APINA because unfortunately we can't travel. Um, so this is us again on a recent, um, Skype call, I think that was, we sort of seem to be using all kinds of platforms, but the work is seeded and hopefully as COVID settles through the early part of the summer, we will really accelerate at pace. So I'll conclude there and rather than conclusions, I thought I'd end with ambitions. So what are we going to try to do? Well, we want to develop a clear appreciation of the psychosocial impact of epilepsy on relationships. We're going to work extremely hard to strengthen the ties between Oxford and partners in Africa. There are lots of such ties, um, but we really want to ensure that in the field of epilepsy, that those uh, become very enduring and work to destigmatize this common condition, which we have known about since the birth of humanity, yet still causes such difficulty for people with the condition and also within the broader uh, network of a person with epilepsy. And I thought I'd end with the fact that acorns can grow into oaks. I'm not saying that we're anywhere near an oak tree yet. We're perhaps here, this first little sapling. Um, but I will always remain grateful to AFOX for that initial grant, which has really seeded uh, um, an amazing journey, which teaches me something new every day. Finally, I'll just conclude with acknowledging all of the people who um, help specifically with these projects, notably Sloan, um, with, who initially introduced me to lots of people in Zimbabwe and who leads all of our ethnographic work. I've learned a tremendous amount from her and Charles, who is the uh, co-chief investigator of the NIHR grant. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Arjun. And you're certainly on your, on your way to becoming an oak. <laughs> And uh, I must congratulate you on the very big strides you've made since the initial starter grant with um, AFOX. And these grants are usually small grants and they're actually intended to do exactly what you've illustrated there, to allow people to start off, build a collaboration and then move on from there and, and become an oak as you have. Now, there's one point you also made that I found very um, helpful in, in your work on, on epilepsy, and that was to contextualize it in ancient beliefs and to sort of give an illustration of how those beliefs endure today and how they seem to be um, affecting current attitudes. For people not in your area, that, that's certainly you know, um, a very clear picture of how, why things might be the way they were. I remember I posed a question in the beginning saying, I wonder how that might relate to mental health because it seems to have some parallels there. Now I'm going to move straight on to the Q&A and um, I see there's quite a few questions here and perhaps I'm going to start with Terry. Uh, who uh, also gave a very fascinating talk and there are quite a few questions there and I'll begin with one that's asking whether there is um, any information on the degree to which Darkwood's views extended um, to a broader political view. So for example, on the colonial structures in which he was um, inevitably immersed. So does the work he did on, on the artifacts did he also have campaigns in other areas that related to the politics of the time? Might you know? Terry? Um, yes, I think um, 
to contextualize my answer and also the, the research that I've presented today, this is just um, part of um, a, a book um, that, um, that I've, I've finished. Um, so I'm amplifying it a little bit right now um, called um, Archival um, Affective States and Archival Excess, um, the Politics of Self-Monumentality in Nigeria Magazine. And it has to do with Dr. editorship of the magazine and also its concatenations with his own presentations of self and all um, the different fronts that he had um, all, all these different um, conflicts that he had with colonial government, and he had many of them. This wasn't his only initiative. Um, he also um, champ um, championed the Clean Up Lagos campaign, on which I wrote an article. Uh, he, uh, his views on um, education and culture were very particular. Um, that were not always as progressive as one would expect um, of a figure um, uh, I think his most progressive work um, actually relates to the work he did um, in terms of um, the preservation of antiquities. Um, everything else was, well, paternalistic to a degree that we wouldn't really accept today. Uh, he also um, established a boys' holiday camp um, in Lagos and also had all these um, all the initiatives at the margins of government, experiments in rural education. So he had his hands in, in way too many pies. And um, most of the issues arose not necessarily from the nature of these projects, but rather because that's not what he was hired to do. He was just hired to um, report on the progress of science teaching in Nigeria and not to go off and do all these things and antagonize government um, both in the magazine and in his um, liaisons um, with higher placed colonial officers, um, officials such as um, Christopher Cox, who was Secretary of State for the Colonies. Um, and at the end of the day, his retirement was, um, his early retirement was in many ways forced by this constant um, tug of war with the authorities, really. I don't know if that responded to the question. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, it does. And you, you also mentioned a very interesting fact that um, Duckworth was at Umuahia College while Chinua Cheva was there as well. And I wondered whether you have a sense of how Duckworth related to the emerging forms of African literature at the time. Right, so um, he wasn't there um, at the same time as Achebe. Achebe was uh, at Umahia Government College between 1944 and 48. And um, Duckworth um, was there in the early 1930s. That was when he was actively um, doing the work that he was hired to do, as I said, which was Inspector of Education. So he did spend some periods um, I don't why not just um, looking into the science teaching of the college, but also teaching um, chemistry and physics himself. Uh, uh, the point that Achebe was at Bokman College, Duckworth had already moved on from um, heavy duty inspectorial duties and was off doing his own thing, um, not just editing magazine, but um, generally setting up all these um, um, initiatives that government found so aggravating. Thank you. Um, Arjun, I have um, a few, a series of questions here that are really points of clarification that I'm going to ask in one go. So one of them is asking whether epilepsy, uh, is there the perception of epilepsy in relationship? No, is epilepsy gendered? So that's one. And does it affect marriage? And then I think the second one is asking why epilepsy is so much more prevalent in low and middle income countries? Um, so, I mean, epilepsy affects men and women. If it's a, so there is, it, it doesn't tend to discriminate according to gender. Um, and the impact of epilepsy on marriage is, it's quite complex and it, it's at multiple levels. So, for example, there's been some work on whether people will declare a diagnosis of epilepsy before marriage or not. And the risk is that if you declare the diagnosis of epilepsy before marriage, then you won't get married because there's a great reluctance, especially amongst older people, um, and, and as we saw in a wide variety of different countries, to allow their children to marry someone with epilepsy. And it's very regrettable that that persists. Um, it was only in the 1970s that the laws 
to um, allow people in the UK legally to marry someone with epilepsy were repealed. Mm -hmm. But then if you, if you don't declare it and then people find out you have epilepsy within marriage, then that can often lead to the, the breakup of the marriage. And that too can be very difficult. So it's, it's very hard to try and disentangle that unless at a sort of community and society level, you can educate about epilepsy and destigmatize it whole scale really so that whole communities will appreciate that epilepsy is a condition it can arise from lots and lots of different causes um, and that feeds into the core the, the second bit about why it may be overrepresented in resource poor settings so the incidence of epilepsy is highest in the early part of life and then as people get older and then it sort of dips in the middle but that early part of life often relates to perinatal trauma, or there might be infections, for example, or if the infections aren't treated early enough, then that can all contribute to epilepsy. And that is perhaps more prevalent in resource poor settings. There's also a lot of epilepsy related to post-traumatic epilepsy. So if there are accidents with head injuries, or epilepsy can also relate to HIV or infections such as neurocystisicosis, for example, is the commonest cause of epilepsy in India. So these are things that you see less of within uh, uh, higher income countries, for example. So that perhaps all contributes, but it's a very important question because as well as being more common, the risks from epilepsy are greater because if you develop epilepsy in the UK, um, then the 60 to 70% of people will get control of the seizures with medication. Whereas if you develop epilepsy and there's an 85% treatment gap, you're not getting that treatment. You're still having seizures. The risk of injury is higher. If you cook on open fires, if you have to wash your clothes um, in running water, for example, all of that just continuously compounds the risk of epilepsy. Um, so hopefully that answers those, those two areas. Yeah, and actually there's another question here, which is also a point of clarification. Is there a link between mental health and epilepsy? And actually in the sense of um, patients with epilepsy struggling with mental health because of you know, the, the situation? Okay, so amazing question and something that deserves a lot of work. So we know that epilepsy and mental health associate very closely together. So if you, have a, if you have epilepsy, there's an up to 30% risk of depression, for example, clinically relevant depression over the life course of the epilepsy. It also associates with anxiety, it can associate much more rarely with psychosis, but it also depends on how broadly you look at mental health. Because if you say mental health also includes um, taking alcohol to excess or substance misuse, for example, all of those can both be a consequence of epilepsy, um, difficulty in coming to terms with the diagnosis, but also cause epilepsy. And mental health can also be incredibly stigmatized. And so there is going to be a lot of commonality within that. And you saw on the How AFOX Changed My Life chart, I had a little box that said dot, dot, dot. And our next project is trying to actually really have a focus on mental health so looking at mental health and epilepsy, again, grounded in this ethnographic approach and also ensuring that we don't just look at the person with epilepsy, but look at their network. So look at relationships and so on and so forth. So great question. Thank you for allowing me to answer that. And I'll just squeeze in one more here. This one is not for clarification. It's asking for your thoughts. What do you consider to be the most successful examples of new approaches to epilepsy in different parts of the world? So um, fantastic question again, and again, quite multi-layered depending on how you look at it. I mean, you could say that, you know, the anti-seizure medications are a great advance and medication called levotrastam, for example, is the, is the new blockbuster anti-seizure medication about two years ago. Uh, sorry, not two years ago, 20 years ago. It's now generic, it's very cheap. It can treat lots of different types of epilepsy, doesn't have, um, the side effects that some of the older anti-seizure medications had. So anti-seizure medications certainly play a role. In high uh, income countries, although we do have a project to try and bring this to low and middle income countries as well, epilepsy surgery has transformed epilepsy care. 
So if you can identify a focus from where the seizures are coming from and remove that focus, you actually can potentially cure epilepsy. So you actually are no longer treating the seizures just with medication, but you're curing the epilepsy. But worldwide, because you've got to think really big scale, the things that are really going to have an impact are going to be ensuring that big institutions like United Nations, World Health Organization, really recognize epilepsy. And potentially that WHO uh, journal, the, the article on epilepsy being a public health imperative, if we really seize that as an opportunity, then hopefully we can then really better understand epilepsy and better treat it. Epilepsy is chronically underfunded as a condition, especially given how prevalent it is. And so those are the future changes. And I think there's going to have to be a lot of work relating to social media, destigmatization through social media and applying technologies at scale through um, low to middle income countries as well as in high income countries is going to really be how we try and solve it. Thank you. I'll, I'll now turn back to Terry. Terry, um, what is your view on the future of the current um, restorative movement? Do you think we will see more arts and artifacts being returned? Well, I don't think I'm, I'm best placed to speculate. I do think that there's definitely a wave um, right now. I think people are becoming a lot more conscious, um, a lot more conscious about the violence encoded in museums and, and in these appropriations and still, and still holding on to um, these artifacts. And um, the signs are there that they, we will see a lot more rest, um, restitutions, but um, I, I do not know, I don't think I'm best placed to say exactly what we're going to see, but I'm very hopeful for the future. When I started working on this, project, I think it was five, six years ago. It's been a while now. It's taken a while to write this book, to be honest. Um, and I, I, I first encountered um, Dogworth and Murray's project. I'd never have, have thought that we would be um, hearing all these um, really encouraging news right now. So it's an exciting time, um, which is why I decided to, it was part of a lot of, of a broader chapter um, and now I've decided to make it into its own chapter because it's so topical and so relevant and it's so um, amazing to see um, how, how far those initiatives have, have, have come and um, all the amazing permutations that they've suffered um, in this space of time. So I'm hopeful. Yeah, and, and just going back to, to um, some of the other work that you do on uh, colonial education and uh, representation and so on, and um, some work on the complex identities that have formed to navigate different spaces. Is there any, do you think there's any link between those sorts of complexities and how the campaigns or the movements or the discussions around uh, looting of artifacts and the difficulties around uh, restitution have taken place? I think um, it, it's something we would have to take on a case-to-case -case, uh, you know, basis. I think um, when it comes to Dogworth, there's definitely um, a connection and that's what part of what my book is trying to explore. On the one hand, we've got um, a man who is a colonial officer and who unlike most of the colonial officers wasn't there for vocational reasons. He just happened to be um, sort of um, so, uh, hired for that job. Um, he was um, teaching in a public school um, in England and didn't close, uh, didn't close college and then he was recruited for the job. So he didn't really have that sort of mindset going out there. But at the same time, he was very loyal to Empire. He very much wanted to progress um, within its um, the different opportunities that it gave for social advancement. And he was caught up between his um, authentic admiration of um, African culture and his desire to actually be in Nigeria, not just um, as um, an ordinary Nigerian citizen, but rather um, 
enjoying all the privileges that came with colonial life. So what happens when an individual is on the one hand seemingly progressive and, and seemingly promoting um, all these um, cultural forms and art, um, but at the same time is very much interested in entrenching him, his position within um, the colonial government. So that's what I'm trying to explore. You see that all these gaps, all these ambivalences and these are the sorts of things that I find uh, that give me as a scholar a lot of critical traction. I'm really interested in the ways in which people try to navigate all these very um, politically fraught spaces. And Dogworth was such a person. Murray also had his own um, complexities, but I, uh, my research just touches on him very, very fairly. So I don't feel like I'm in a position to comment on that. All right, thank you for that. And you know, as we draw for a close, I'm also going to ask Arjun one tricky question. Um, a lot of people found your presentation very inspiring as well. And um, one has to wonder how uh, your research will be affected. I know you spoke about the WHO and, you know, sort of gaining uh, traction there with, you know, the channel that came out and so on. But how will your research be affected by the recent ODA cuts uh, by the UK government? Uh, yes, thank you. Well, I mean, at a personal level, I think it's a tragedy that that's occurring. I think that if... Uh, during the COVID pandemic, we've shown how interrelated societies all around the world are. And actually, this is a point where we should be supporting each other rather than looking to cut ODA funding. In terms of how it will affect us, well, a lot of things are affecting the research landscape at the moment. Um, but we will work within that. The most important thing is that we are lucky to have a, an amazing team, you know, a great team of people, a lot of people, um, in fact, the whole team goes way above and beyond what anyone would expect them to do. So we're optimistic that despite um, the ODA cutting uh, of, of resource, which I really think is not appropriate and it, really uh, it will only be it's very short termist as well it's not going to lead to long-term benefits to do that we will still work within that envelope um, put together the best projects that we can because the grants are going to be that much more competitive and and see how we go thank you very much and now it remains for me to thank the audience and the speakers for the very interesting and fascinating talks our time has come to an end but just a quick reminder that our next in Saka will be at the same time uh, in a month's time and that will be thursday 3rd june and we all hope to see you there thank you very much and goodbye <laughs>